Welcome to the podcast of the European Society of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care. I am your host, Alex Rawlings. I am the Patient Safety and Simulation Project Manager here at SIEC. Today we have Professor Jennifer Hunter with us. And uh, as an introduction, uh, Professor Jennifer Hunter started her medical training at the University of St. Andrews before moving to work at Dundee Royal Infirmary. She took up an SHO position at Alda Hay Children's Hospital in Liverpool at a time when it was at the cutting edge of paediatric anaesthesia. She later moved into academic anaesthesia as a lecturer at the University of Liverpool, where she remained for many years. She was also an honorary secretary for the Anaesthetic Research Society and was the first woman to become the editor-in-chief of the British Journal of Anaesthesia and later chair of the BJA board. She has also been a prominent member of SIEC and the details of which we will discuss in this podcast. Professor Jennifer Hunter, Jenny, welcome to our podcast. I'm very happy to speak with you today. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to ask you, what drew you to choose anesthesiology as your speciality? Oh, well, that's quite easy to answer because uh, when I was a student, I was quite interested in psychiatry, actually. There was... uh, family members who were psychiatrists, that probably was a a factor. But uh, we were taught psychiatry very well as undergraduates. And then I did actually do six months psychiatry after house jobs, but I was so disillusioned because all the theory that we've been taught in the textbooks didn't seem to exist on the wards where there were so many social problems as well as uh, dementia problems and all those classic psychiatric cases from the textbook didn't seem to exist very often. But whilst I was doing my surgical house job, I was fascinated by what the anaesthetist was doing. I saw drugs being injected intravenously, but I couldn't really work out how they were working and what was happening. So much as I enjoyed my surgical house job on the professorial unit in Dundee, I was attracted then. So I applied and had to wait to to start anaesthesia uh, in that city. Uh, about 18 months later. And was it as interesting as you expected it to be? I didn't have any regrets about doing anaesthesia. Is that what you mean? Yeah, 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 no, definitely, um, definitely. No, no regrets. You're no regret, Ria, uh, on that front. But uh, I realised psychiatry wasn't going to be for me. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and were there any inspirations in your, in your uh, early, early days? Was there anybody that really inspired you in your early part of your journey? I had inspiration throughout my career. That's what's kept me going and taken me from strength to strength right up to today. Um, That's been very important. So um, when I started anaesthesia in Dundee, it was a very sound, broad, basic training that I received. Uh, But I realized that it wasn't as big enough a center to complete all my training. And that was what took me to Liverpool in part, really. Um, That... I realised I needed specialist paediatric and cardiac and neuroanesthesia training. And at Alder Hay Children's Hospital at that time, in the late 70s, uh, I was sitting at the feet of the greats of paediatric anesthesia, Jackson Reese and Gordon Bush. Okay. These were leaders in the world. Yeah. So, I mean, that was a marvellous start. And then uh, throughout my training in Liverpool, actually, I had many a specialist clinical mentors but when I went into the university department uh, that was when I had the most intense training really in, in the sense that the second professor of anaesthesia in Liverpool John Utting was probably my main mentor but I was surrounded by experts in the field who were examples for me to follow. And what uh, type of mentor was he? Uh, John Utting? Well yeah. uh, John Utting was um, a gentleman of the true British sort. Uh Uh, So he treated everybody with respect, whoever they were. Mm -hmm. And I think I felt I learnt a lot from him in that respect, whether it was the cleaner that came in first in the morning or the vice chancellor of the university, John Utting treated everybody the same with grace and courtesy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very important facet for success, certainly at the very top. Uh, So he was a great example. He taught me how to write. He thought my ability to write papers was appalling when I joined him. And I got used to the red pen very quickly. Uh, But of course, I've tried to, to, 
I've tried to use him as an example as I became more senior. But he wasn't the only one. The professor of veterinary anesthesia set me up in my laboratory research with animal studies. And he was a very com a completely different character, but also very hardworking and obsessional in his attention to detail. And Dr. Riding, who was uh, a future chair of the faculty of anesthetists, the Royal College of Surgeons, as it was, he b was an editor of the BJA before me. And uh, he was another gentleman who um, encouraged me as far as the journal was concerned. So I had several male mentors in the report. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's very important. And I think it exemplifies the fact that you need to work in a center of excellence where you're surrounded by expertise. You can't do this alone. You can't yeah. succeed greatly by yourself. You need constant supervision throughout your career in different ways. Yeah, and they, they talk a lot about the what's called the hidden curriculum, which is the the influences that we pick up on our mm, journey yes. through those that we have around us, yes. both for positive and for negative. Yes. And it sounds like you had extremely positive Yes, uh, yes. And I was encouraged all the way, particularly by the people I've mentioned to, first of all, be involved nationally with yeah. the Anesthetic Research Society. They led me to the ARS. There was no question of not going. We went and we presented our work. And, uh, you know, I was just clearly, t I was clearly told what I'd have to do, but uh, there was no question of what, what I did. And of course, too, John Utting and uh, Edmund Riding were certainly involved with me joining the board of the British Journal of Anesthesia as the first female member of that board. That was thanks to them. I'd yeah. like, like to ask you uh, about another um, inspiration on your journey is that when you joined the research group at the University of Liverpool, uh, you were under the influence of Professor Cecil Gray. Well, Cecil Gray was the first professor of anaesthesia in Liverpool. He had actually retired about the time I became a lecturer, but okay. he was the dean of the medical school by then. But he set up the research work in Liverpool on neuromuscular blocking drugs. He developed what was known as the Liverpool anaesthetic technique, wow, yeah. which was uh, accepted across Europe. And uh, that technique became a standard practice. Whatever the patient's age or however debilitated they were, mm -hmm. artificial ventilation, hyperventilation, and balanced light anesthesia. And so that was established by the time I joined as a young lecturer. Wow. But then a new generation of neuromuscular blocking drugs came along in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, I was very fortunate to benefit from the introduction of Atricurium and Vecuronium and then another generation into the 90s, yeah. then reversal agents into yeah. the noughties and so it went on, mm. yeah. Mm. And how did you first get involved with, with SAIC as it's now known? Yes, well, when uh, I was chairing the board of the BJA, there was a great effort to increase the number of non-British board members. And the second person to join in that respect was Hans Preby from Freiburg who was one of the first presidents mm -hmm. of the new ESA, as I refer to it. The new ESA was formed from the merger of the European Academy, Censor, and the old European Society of Anesthesia rather than anesthesiology. Right. And so the three came together and Hans Preby, being the first president, realized he wanted new blood into, I was a member of the ESA, but he okay. wanted new blood in the management levels. Yep. And so he, he encouraged several people, including myself, to apply for the senior posts in the secretariat, one of which was the scientific program committee, as we call it then. Yeah. So I had to apply and in open competition, uh, I was appointed to that post. So here again is another example of uh, a guy encouraging me to go in the right direction, together yeah. with George Hall, who was also on the BJ board and the ESA council. But I, I suppose it wasn't just so much that you had the opportunity, it was that you were willing to take it. Oh yes, but yeah. in life generally, if yeah. you don't take the opportunities that come yeah. along, I mean, it's your fault, isn't it, yeah. if you don't succeed? Yeah. And that is a basic message. There's nothing clever about that, you yeah. know. Uh, I'm rather fatalistic, I've just taken what's come along. Mm. But if you turn things down at length, you're not going to move forward very fast. No, no And no. that doesn't ma matter which country you come from, which sex you are, or anything like that. Yeah. You know, just take what comes along and make the most of it. 
And th this leads me to my next question, is, is the roles that you've played in the society. Um, so you, you were appointed to Scientific Committee Chair. Was that the title, of the yes. name of the title at the well, time? Well, at the time it was called Scientific Programme Committee Chair, yes. Okay. And that was a very exciting new challenge for me because although I chaired the BJ board, which was mostly men of senior academic status, um, for the, they were all English speaking. And that for the first time I was chairing a board in which many nationalities were represented, most mm. of whom did not have English as their first language. And what I learned from that was that you had to go exactly by what someone said. Body language and nuance didn't focus on what the, you were trying to get over in that time. You just had to take them verbatim. Mm -hmm. And that was a new experience for me because uh, I was very used to, by this time, sensing people's mood yeah. and movement and the like. And that was much more difficult than that. But I was so pleased to meet people from many different areas of anaesthesia that I didn't work in because of this, okay. as well as from many other countries. Uh, and of course, that is how I first got to know people like Andreas Herft and Paolo yeah. Filosi. And uh, because the chair of the scientific program committee sat ex officio on, for instance, the research committee. Okay. Which, okay. when I first joined, Paolo Pelosi as a board member was chairing the research committee. So uh, it gave me a host of new mentors yeah. because over time, Paolo pushed me into doing many other things for oh, the ESAIC. Yeah. Okay. So it's the same example occurring again and again. And of course, the message to me is, as I've got older, to do the same things for the next generation. So by your works, will you know them? That's yeah. what Christopher Wren said. Yeah. And um, I think it's, uh, it's the most important aspect of mentoring, really. I would, I would have to agree with that. It's a, it's a vital aspect. And of all the roles that you've had with SAIC, which, is a, which have you enjoyed most and why? Oh, well, I think the SPC, because of um, the vast number of people I met from mm -hmm. many different cultures and nationalities and specialties, Oh, because they are all opened up new doors and here today I still see see many of them you know. so doubt, undoubtedly that but uh, then I joined the nominations committee and that was Professor Pelosi by this time was chair was president okay and um, he encouraged me to join the nominations committee and I realized afterwards why because he wanted a lot of the documentation of um, defining the roles of all the different committees and the roles of the chairman of those committees. And that. there were draft documents made, but a lot of them weren't in good English and they were rather sketchy. So Paolo yeah. <laughs> realized that he was uh, a primarily English speaker who yeah. could, uh, uh, because of her experience with journal editing, could help get these documents into a better uh, order. And so when I was on the nominations committee, which of course was primarily for appointing senior members of the ESA, yeah. I was in very truth spending more time getting these documents into good English. For which Paolo always thanked me, but of oh. course it was, um, that was a more uh, tedious task in that I wasn't mixing with people doing that. That was homework. Yeah. Mm. And, and, um, the SI obviously had a vision then of, of inclusive, inclusivity and, and, yes. and, and trying to create a gender balance mm. within their organisation. Mm. Mm. Uh, did you feel that it was a, that was a, a very positive step at the time, that it was proactively... I've always felt that there has been no hurdles for uh, people who weren't white Caucasian Protestant males to mm -hmm. jump over in the ESA, I see. Okay. But because I've just exemplified the support I got in yeah. doing it. Uh, I, ideally, of course, it would be better. And mm -hmm. things, of course, when Daniela became president uh, yeah. and we had our first female president of the SA, that was a very major step forward. And she encouraged many more women to apply for council and the board, especially from Eastern Europe. And there, was, yeah. where there were more women doing anesthesia at senior posts in the Eastern Europe, like in Russia, than yeah. there has been in the West, uh, historically. Oh, yeah. So um, she was obviously going as a, a great example for other women to mm -hmm. follow in their footsteps. 
And now, of course, we've got uh, Professor Matto as chair of the scientific committee. So we're not our second female. So I know that the council and the board have tried to actively encourage more mm. female membership. Of course, if women don't apply, yeah. uh, then you can't appoint them. And, and that's where the mentor role comes into force because as I say, the, my early mentors push me forward to do things. Yeah. And perhaps women have needed more encouragement to do things. As I said to you, I wouldn't have gone to national UK meetings without that pressure when yeah. I was much younger. And so I would say that women need perhaps more encouragement to move forward. Many women, not all women. And do you feel that there are, there are still areas where women are underrepresented? Within the ESAIC or generally? Uh, generally, I'd say within, within anesthesiology, healthcare and within SIC. There, there are at the very top. I think, mm -hmm. I think I only felt I met a glass ceiling when I applied for my chair, chair position in Liverpool, in the chair okay. of anesthesia. And then uh, that was not from within the medical profession. That was because, of course, as a university appointment, there were professors of music and professors of civil engineering on my yeah. appointments committee. Yeah. So uh, I did sense a bit of uh, a glass ceiling then. But of course, that's 20 odd years ago now. So even there's been a lot of improvement since then. This is two sided. Organizations have got to make effort to make sure they're employing women, but women have got to reach the required standards for the job. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not saying that you should yeah. be appointing women unless they're fully qualified and experienced for jobs, no. And do you see any other hurdles there? In, wh wh in what way do you mean? In, in, the, in the sense that uh, even if the positions were available and the qualifications were, were there for, mm. for women, mm. are there any other societal aspects that perhaps... Well, you've got to make sure that appointments committees, for instance, have a mixture of different countries and uh, uh, females and males and uh, everything else on the committee. So uh, from the nominations committee point of view at the ASAIC, for instance, it was important to define who should be on appointments committees yeah. to get a broad spectrum of representation. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And, and culturally, do you think there's a, there are also challenges there for women that, that uh, the roles that they have within the family and within mm within mm. their own culture perhaps yes. sometimes limits yes. what, what they uh, can do. And cultures vary. Some are much more positive as, uh, towards women at the top, for instance, as I say, in Eastern yeah. Europe and India and the like. But um, I think the internet age has helped in this sense because of course, I spent many a, uh, an evening on the train backwards and forwards to Brussels or yeah. to the airport and the like. And for women with small children, that can become difficult yeah and i um i think that the internet age where we can have more zoom meetings i don't want them all the time mm. but for minor communications for instance chatting to the administrators at brussels from my office when i was spc chair would have been much more enjoyable through zoom that wasn't available then so the internet age has helped that that has helped that yeah but um i could not have been editor-in-chief of the BJAA uh, if I'd have had small children to look after. It was 28 hours or 30 hours a week of work on top of my other formal commitment. That's a so, yeah, total so commitment, you, isn't you it? Can't, uh, you can't run, run around young children or a husband who's fully busy himself. Yeah. So uh, I fully admit that. And I'm, I don't know the answer to part-time working at the very top of yeah. uh, any administrative body, ESA, IC or other. I don't know. I, I think there are certain jobs which require full commitment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you spend a good portion of your career involved in research and publishing research. Uh, is there anything that's currently being researched that excites you? Well, of course, in recent years, I've been very involved with post-operative pulmonary complications and the relationship to the use of neuromuscular blocking drugs perioperatively. And one of the first pan-European multi-centre trials that the ESA set up was popular at uh, studying just this uh, uh, question. Did neuromuscular blocking drugs affect the incidence of post-operative pulmonary complications? And uh, that was 23,000 
patients from across Europe recruited with the, all the administration done in the Secretariat in Brussels. We couldn't, we couldn't do those sort of studies without a very strong secretarial backup in, uh, in Brussels with all the electronic data collection that that required. And Andreas Herft and Paolo Pelosi, they set up these trials. And in fact, the ESAIC, I think now, amongst anesthesiology societies, leads the world on these pan-European prospective studies. I've just been to a data monitoring uh, committee about one of them. Uh, so um, that's been a very exciting development. And from a research point of view, it's put this society right up there at the top uh, of anaesthetic research. So, and it continues to grow and grow. It's exponential, its development. Yeah. Yeah. So that's been a very exciting area, which I'm pleased because of my own interests to have been in, involved in. Yeah. You know. yeah. And it continues. Mm -hmm. um, what motivates you most today? Today, yeah. sitting here now. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think as you, I'm now at the stage in a career that I can choose much more what I have to do. Okay. And that's an indulgence which for decades I didn't have. Undergraduates always had to be taught anaesthesia. Yeah. Uh, operating lists always had to go on, whatever my research interest. Uh, so all the, uh, they're not drags of a job, but the mundane aspects of the job, yeah. which take up a lot of time and prevent you doing the research you want to do, prevent you writing as you want to, they, uh, they are ebbing away now because I'm senior enough to choose what I want to do. And indeed, during the wretched COVID lockdowns of 2021, 20, I wrote more papers in one uh, calendar year than I'd ever done because I, it kept me sane during those, yeah. that first lockdown when we couldn't go out. We could yeah. only go out for an hour a day and walk a mile and a half, you know. So that kept me sane. There's no doubt about it because I was doing things that I liked doing. So your, your freedom and your... And Zoom to, meetings, yeah. which a lot of them through the ESA uh, of, uh, you know, and talking about research interests of my own for yeah. web, webinars. Mm. And as, as a final question, I'd like to ask you, um, from your, your, ex, your wealth of experience, uh, for, for younger doctors who are, who are climbing the ladder, there are technical skills and technical ability that, mm. is, uh, that is obviously very important. Mm. But then we have the non-technical skills mm. that doctors acquire. Mm -hmm. And are there any specific areas that you would urge younger doctors to develop in their body of skills uh, in order to come out on top in their career or to, to just mm. Uh, mm. achieve the yes. best? Yes, this is very topical now, isn't it? The mm. non-technical skills, the human skills. And as I said to you earlier, I saw senior men who were my mentors have many of the essential skills to succeed at the very top. And an important one is man management and communication skills. And as I said, John Utting treated everybody the same. Yeah. And that is with courtesy and correctness. And it might have seemed a bit old fashioned at times, but it worked. And I think that many men and women who fail to make the very top fail because of their communication limitations. If you can't handle people, however hard you work, however intelligent you are, mm. if you don't have some ability to lead a team and feel one of the team by your own example, which of course is mainly working hard and having those abil technical abilities, but in addition being a team player, then you'll not succeed to the very top. We see that across politics, we see it across every walk of life. It's just as important in medicine as any other area. And how would, how would one go about developing these skills? Well, some people have more natural talent than others, don't mm -hmm. they? Yeah. And I mean, one always likes to think one has some natural talent in this thing. But again, following example, but I think that the boss is in first in the morning, work shown to be working hard. Nobody's going to follow your example if you're skiving off at three o'clock in the afternoon, are they? Mm -hmm. They want to see you 
giving good anesthetics and being very competent as a clinician. Mm -hmm. They want to see you able to lecture at meetings like this and in teach your own trainees how to lecture at meetings like this. Teach mm -hmm. your own trainees how to write papers and produce posters mm -hmm. and the like. So working with your trainees all the time to improve their skills and admitting to your own weaknesses. Oh, you've got to be able to admit to your own weaknesses. I think, I think that's, that's, a, uh, I think that's a sign huge. of great success yeah. is being able to say, you know, I, I'm not good at this. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying hard, it doesn't come easily. Yeah. Uh, because inevitably everyone has some skills that they're better at than others. Yes. Yes, that old saying, a fish can't whistle and neither can I. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But, uh, I can't sing. I'd love to be able to. <laughs> I'd love to be able to. That's my main weakness. Oh, bless. <laughs> um, the, yes, the, we talk a lot about psychological safety in, in environments, but I think um, there are certain qualities in leadership, and I wouldn't call them old-fashioned. I'd call them timeless because they, they still hold true as mm -hmm. a value. Mm -hmm. Is uh, the capacity to build uh, approachability Mm -hmm. and trust oh. mm -hmm. uh, and, and these are elements of psycho psychological safety important elements and, and uh, uh, for me they've always been the qualities of, of good leadership what do you think it is that allows somebody to to have that capacity within themselves to, to yeah I think women on the whole are more approachable than men actually okay uh, unless they're absolutely ferocious <laughs> um, I think they are on the whole more approachable yeah. and I think that uh, I think that there are some uh, men in particular of very high intellect and very well driven and very hard working and completely capable who are so impressive that they frighten people off. Yeah. So and that is another reason for admitting to your occasional weaknesses. Makes you, you know. human. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, uh, and I feel that women are better at that. The, the men. Do you think it's a humility thing? It's a yes, I suspect so. That's I expect so too. Yeah, mm. and also um, you have to give people a bit of time for the small talk. And some of those characters that I've just described don't do any small talk. Yeah. Uh, but you've got to spend time with people, yeah. whether it's going for a, a pint after work yeah. or uh, you know, organising parties, dinners, or whatever. You have to spend time with them outside of the hard grit of your work. Mm -hmm. That's uh, it's, it's and again, that comes easier to some people. <clears throat> so, some people are more sociable than others, aren't they? I think yeah. It's, it's also recognizing that those those aspects are important, and therefore, if they are perhaps your weak spot, that you commit time mm -hmm. to those elements because but, you realize their value. But I do think that trainees respect hard work and ability more than anything else. They don't mind eccentricity. Okay, Trainee yeah. doctors quite like a bit of eccentricity, you yeah, know, yeah. and you've got to play on that sometimes. Yeah. Um, so they don't mind any of that as long as they see an output and an effect and benefit to all concerned from the boss. Jenny, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. Thank, Thank you, you very much for your Thank time. You. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's very kind. You're very welcome. Thank you, everybody, to listening to this episode. The SIEC releases monthly podcasts on the SIEC website and various streaming platforms. We hope you will join us for the next one.